Oh, great. Oh, damn it. What? Oh, I just spilled my coffee. <laughs> no, I knew that would happen. That's right, I've got... A... <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually in the spare room. There's a pile of ironing, so I'm going to use one of my shirts to mop, mop up the ironing. Your recently laundered I'm shirts to mop up the coffee. Go to put, it back in, put it back in the wash, that's all right. Are, okay. are, you, are you sat or are you kneeling again? I'm kneeling. Is he, it's the most comfortable that's position. Right. Yes, yeah, my podcasting position. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Hey Richard. I'm really well. How are you? Pretty good, thanks. Apart I've from just the fact that I'm sitting in a pool of coffee. You're sitting. Si- you're sitting in a pool of coffee. Yeah. Well, I've just had a lovely plate of sausage and eggs. Ah, oh. well, we're set to go, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Uh, eggs from my my little chickens that run around in the. Ah, garden. and really sausage nice. from your little piggies, or uh... no, 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 sausage, no, sausage from a supermarket. <laughs> anyway, can you believe it? Another episode. It can't be another episode. <laughs> it can't be. Really? Yeah. Doesn't time fly when you're enjoying yourself? I know, absolutely. And then sometimes also not. <laughs> uh, even when you're not enjoying yourself, I meant, you know, trying to say that you're not yeah, having yeah, fun yeah, on the I podcast. Yeah, we all know what you meant, Jimmy. Yeah, so what number checking. are we up to now? This is pod four. Pod four. Yes. Very good. So we're assuming that people have listened to pod one, the prequel, and pod two and three. Well, if you don't know who we are, then just go back and listen to pod one and or two and three. <laughs> no, and I think a little bit know. of introduction is probably worth doing, isn't it? You're Richard James. You're, you're Jamie Olivier. Anderson. Well, you're Olivier, Olivier nominated. Now, actor. we need to set the record straight. I'm not personally Olivier nominated. I was part of an Olivier nominated production. <laughs> You've got a pin that says Olivier nominee on it. So, That's as true, far as that. I'm concerned, that yeah. makes you okay. Olivier nominated. Okay? okay, I can live with that. Yeah, also, star of Space Precinct. Yes. Although you might not recognise your face. No, I should uh, hope not. Under a mask. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, also, Sir Gadabout. Yeah, well done. Uh, am I high? Yes, yes. My well parents done. are aliens. Were you in that as well? Hey, my parents are aliens. You are very good. You've been yeah, checking up go. on me, haven't you? I know. I, weirdly, these things all just came back. Anyway, star <laughs> of stage and screen. And you've been very busy recently doing uh, David Walliam's Awful Auntie. Gosh, yes, that's right. Pictures um, of you in a wig. Mm, I am all over the shop at the moment. That's right. Yeah. So I'm currently touring the country with uh, David Williams or Volante uh, and this week we were at the Sunderland Empire where I was joined by David actually now here's the thing it, not David Williams this is another David uh, when we come to Fab Live which some listeners might know is our monthly Facebook uh, broadcast on Jerry Anderson uh, Facebook page uh, I have a picture of David who met me at stage door and um, he's an uber space precinct fan Amazing. So he had many things for me to sign. He had pictures and uh, toys and books and all sorts. Uh, so yeah, that was wonderful. Uh, but yes, if you're if you're uh, of a mind to come and see me in in awful aunties, I uh, roll around the country. Then then do. It'd be lovely to uh, to meet up afterwards and enjoy a, a chat with uh, with Jerry Anderson fans, with fellow like-minded fans. Uh, yeah, and you are Jamie Anderson, of course, son of the legendary Jerry, uh, producer, writer, and director in your own right preserving your father's legacy, moving forward with brand new ideas, such as Jerry Anderson's Firestorm and many other things that we can't even speak about aloud, can we? Unspeakable things. Yes, yes. unspeakable things. <laughs> that's right. Anyway, thanks for that nice intro. Well, I oh. think that's the intro's done, isn't it? Yeah. Did you hear my little dog having a scratch then? Right. Was that... His little collar flicked around. It's very really cute. No, we'll, we'll leave it in. It's fine. Yes, everyone's a critic. <laughs> dog having anyway, a scratch. If you've come this far and you've listened this far and you haven't paused us already, then clearly this is the kind of nonsense you want to listen to. So please do subscribe. Yes. Uh, and at the end of the podcast, if you've enjoyed it, then rate and review us because it really helps people find the podcast. And, you know, tell your friends by normal, uh, non-digital means, you know, like tell them to listen to it in person, down mm-hmm. the pub or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, arrange some sky writing. Yeah. Uh, Get it written on a T-shirt. Anything like that would yeah. be brilliant. Yeah, we've been very heartened so far, haven't we, by uh, by the, the amount of listeners that we've had and the numbers oh, are, are growing lovely. daily, which is lovely. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for tuning in, Richard. What's coming up? We've got lots coming up. 
in the next, uh, well, who knows, an indeterminate length of time. Uh, yeah. We've got Jerry Anderson news, of course, news from uh, all around the Jerry Anderson universe, of, uh, things coming up, um, merchandise, uh, production news, and so on. Uh, we have uh, a few listeners getting in touch with questions. Uh, we have an interview. Now, you've been out and about again, haven't you? And you've been buying people lunch again, I understand. Well, this one wasn't lunch, actually. Was, was that right? Uh, but you know, it was, we had dinner in, in the end, but no, this is, uh, this is an interview with a comic artist. Uh, legendary co-host of Fab Live yes. and all-round jolly nice chap who I uh, jointly invented uh, a dance with to uh, Wild Boys. Right. Um, yeah, shortly after doing the Joe 90 dance, we'd had a few beers. Right. Uh, Is this on video o- somewhere? Sadly not. Shame. Happily not. <laughs> uh, but we had a few more beers and a chat about uh, Lee's kind of introduction to the Anderson world working with Mike Noble, yeah. you know, all, all his bits and pieces he's done in his amazing career and also what he thinks is so great about Jerry Anderson. And he does a really nice little summary about that at the end mm. of our chat. I'm sure. So, yeah, the, do do hang around for that and get, you know, cut through all the nonsense that we're going to deliver and then you'll get to the, the gold at the end. <laughs> right. Well, there's a promise. There's a carrot and stick approach, isn't it? Yeah, the wonderful Lee Sullivan, uh, I know, will be known to many of you through his uh, legendary uh, convention appearances. Uh, I mean, he crops up all over the place, doesn't he? And he does. we'll, uh, we'll do a doodle of you for uh, if, if if money crosses his palm. Yeah, otherwise he won't do it. No, of course not. Quite right. Yeah. Too. Is it now? Is this another two-part uh, interview like we have nope. with Fire Miles, or is this, this is a one? long, a long one-parter? Great, great, <laughs> very exciting. So we have an interview with uh, with comic artist Lee Sullivan coming up, and of course we have another randomizer from the brilliant Chris Dale. Now the yes. randomizer is where he's presented with a random episode of a Jerry Anderson program. Uh, and he's forced, I don't know, is he tied up? Forced to watch and comment on the episode. Yeah, uh, he's, he's held at puppet gunpoint. <laughs> yeah, they weren't great at aiming, were they, actually? So perhaps he's quite safe. He'd probably be all right, yeah, but still. Uh, so all that to come. News, uh, emails, interviews, and another randomised with Chris Dale on the Jerry Anderson podcast. In the meantime, you can get in touch with us. Please do at podcast at Jerry Anderson. Dot co dot uk. Uh, you can send us some questions, you can send us your thoughts. Uh, we have been asking, uh, did you ever meet Jerry? Uh, tell us about that. Uh, we've been asking, how has Jerry inspired you in your life? Maybe in your choice of career, or cosplaying, or model building, kit building, that sort of stuff. So anything that's pertinent to the Jerry Anderson universe, we want to hear it. Uh, send it to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Yep, no question or thought too big or small. No, that's true, luckily. <laughs> Well, I think that's enough uh, waffle, isn't it? Should we get on with some news? There's so much waffle. Uh, yes, let's do it. Here's the news. I, God, I love the news music bed. Mm, isn't mm. it great, Richard? And what are, you really... en- are you enjoying it right now? I it's mean... fantastic. It's great. It's really nice. It's, it's exciting. It's vibrant. Yeah. It's vital. Yeah. It's very newsy. Um, yeah. God, I could just sit and listen to it. But we shouldn't do that. We should uh, <laughs> cover some actual news. <laughs> Would you what, like some? What news is there? Well, you know it's Joe 90's 50th anniversary this year. Now, does that mean Joe 90 himself is 50 years old? Because... No, well, well mm. Richard, you know, Rich, Joe is a puppet, of course. Oh. So he never ages. What? But I have had plenty of people saying, oh, well, actually, it's 50 years since it was made and Joe was nine in the show, so it's Joe's 59th birthday. There we are. It's Joe's Joe McLean's 59th birthday, but it's the <laughs> show's 50th anniversary, which yes. is very exciting. And uh, in honour of that, uh, whether you view your cult TV in standard or high definition, there's some mm. good news for you. Ooh. Yeah, so there's a brand new repackaged DVD release that ITV have just put out of Joe 90 with a, lo- with a lovely new cover and Joe looking very stern indeed inside the big rat. Mm. And Network, our lovely friends at Network Distributing, uh, who we'll, we will be speaking to very soon actually uh, in the next few episodes about their restoration work on the Jerry Anderson shows. Oh yes. Um, they are releasing Joe 90 in high definition. Oh, amazing. Uh, Brand new Blu-rays, first volume of which should be coming later this year, September, October time. Um, and I've seen some of the early work, and goodness me, it is beautiful. Great. They always do beautiful work. All the stuff looks, you know, like it was shot yesterday. Yeah. But Joe 90 in particular, uh, that the opening title sequence of the big rat spinning, it just yeah. looks amazing. So oh. keep an eye out for that. Um, yeah. There is in fact <clears throat> a, a preview episode of that 
newly restored set on Network's upcoming Captain Scarlet HD box set, which is Ooh. limited to 1,250 units worldwide. Mm -hmm. First thousand units available through networkonair.com. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be some other units floating around. I wonder where they might be. I don't know yet. Mm. Uh, yeah. We'll find out. Yes, but I've seen some, seen some preview images and I've seen the, uh, the, the prototype version of the box set and it is lovely. Probably the finest thing that Network has ever put out, I would say. So, um, and it's only £25. So, Gosh. Yeah, uh, that's right. Know, it's good value, isn't it? Don't miss out on that. No. So that's rather exciting. Will you, are you, will you be watching... Uh, well, if I've had the time. Of Come well, January, I will be gainfully unemployed and I'll be able to sit down and watch all this stuff. Oh, well, that'll be nice, won't, won't it? it? That'll be my rest. treat. Maybe, maybe we could join Chris Dale for an episode of The Randomizer. Well, that would be fun, wouldn't it? We should do that, shouldn't we? We should do that. Yeah, OK. I'll ask Chris. He might, yeah. I mean, he might not let us, but... <laughs> oh, no, no, he might not. <laughs> uh, Carrying on from some Captain Scarlet news and also crossing into the Thunderbirds universe, unusually for an Anderson TV-related thing. Yeah. Yeah? You know the Martian exploration vehicle, Richard? Mm -hmm. I do. Of course you do, but for those that don't, yeah. uh, it's attached to the front of the Zero X from one of the Thunderbirds films from the 60s, but is also uh, the vehicle that begins the war against the Mysterons uh, indeed. by mistakenly firing on them. That's right. We have just put up for pre-order on the Jerry Hansen store a lovely little Martian exploration vehicle, MEV, if you will, yeah. uh, replica model produced by Planet Replicas exclusively for us, and it follows on from the lovely Spectrum Hovercraft model. Beautiful, um, yes, that was lovely. almost sold out. Right. Uh, so you can pre-order that now, which is very exciting. Uh, and neatly segueing from that Captain Scarlet Thunderbirds thing into something purely Thunderbirds, mm -hmm. I've had lots of tweets and emails and stuff, people shouting at me in the street. No, <laughs> well, we get that, that anyway. Yeah, but that's for different reasons, isn't it? That's just heckling. Yes. No, they've been asking about Thunderbirds Beyond the Horizon. Yes, now is what is the, this? Well, it's a live uh, interactive theatrical performance thing, yeah. which is ha starting later this year. Um, we don't know very much about it. Nobody knows very much about is it. Is it a two-man show uh, with two actors running about the stage with uh, models on their heads? Well... Because it, I have a feeling I, that's been done before. I don't think it is that, unfortunately. <laughs> as amazing as that was. Yes. Well, it was when I was in it in 1996. Thunderbirds well, FAB. Well, yeah, it was a, it was an amazing show. That's right. Andy uh, Dawson and, and that, uh, Gavin Robinson. And Gavin Roberts. Mm. And uh, Wayne Forrest did Indeed. a bit. And yeah. you did a bit. And yeah. who was the other chap? Uh, Paul Kent did it a long time. Yeah. Uh, yes. That's right. Well, and I think it toured speaking, and toured and toured, didn't it, for years? We're speaking to Wayne Forrester in a few weeks' time as well. Great. Those time, so lots of people checked it. Anyway... This new live theatrical show, I mean, the news is basically that I don't know anything about it. Mm. Um, is but... that news? <laughs> or well, is that lack of news? The news element is yes. that I'm, uh, I've been invited down to see the team and to see what they're up to down at the, uh, the, the location. I don't know if they've announced it, so I best not say where it is, just in case. Mm. Anyway, I'm going there in a couple of weeks' time, and hopefully they will give me some news that I will be able to share with podcast listeners in due course. Because it sounds like it could be quite a fun thing. It does. Thing. Absolutely right, yeah. That's right. But let's see. Great. So um, all of the models and so on are all available at the Jerry Anderson store. So that's shop.jerryanderson.co.uk. Is that correct? It certainly is. Nice now, Jamie, plug. how Thank open you. are you to people suggesting things that they might want to buy? And if there were sufficient numbers, you might think about... Uh, I, for example, I've got an idea. Go that's on. where I'm heading. I've got an idea. What about some UFO purple wigs? And string vests. <laughs> I think I could rock one of those string vests with purple wigs. I was going to say, you could absolutely yeah. uh, rock a purple Couldn't wig. I? Now, Richard, I don't think they ever wore the purple wigs and the string vests together. Oh, so you well. you have to keep the wig for weekends and the vest for weekdays. <laughs> the vest for best. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I would, I, yeah, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't pay to see that. No. I, it would be amusing to There's see it. There's an image. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, also, no, absolutely. Do you know what the best, the best thing to do, if you've got a product idea, um, email... Tim mm. at jerryanderson.co.uk and Tim will look at the feasibility of it and we'll talk about it and see if it's possible. Quite often it's not, you know. Yeah. It's it's yeah. very, very expensive to make a new product yeah. and and a lot of the things are quite niche and specialist. But, but we if do enough our people best. perhaps ask for the same thing, then uh, it might be a go, might not it? Yeah, exactly. We Tim at jerryanderson.co.uk. I mean, he sounds a bit like one of Jerry's famous acronyms, doesn't he? T-I-M. <laughs> Tim, the... Yeah. Uh, uh, Inspector no. of no, international no, no, no. Top Marketing inventor of merchandise. merchandise. I no. Who knows? Anyway, no. It's a person. It's t it's Tim who does our customer support and all sorts of stuff. It's brilliant. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, anything else, Richard? Uh, well, we should also add some very quick congratulations to Felix Burke, 
Now, Felix Burke is the 2018 winner of the Jerry Anderson Film Miniature Award, uh, which is at the New Blades Showcase in London a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so what's that all about, Jamie? Tell us a little bit more about the uh, Jerry Anderson Film Miniature Award and Felix Burke, who was this year's winner. Well, New Blades is, is like a showcase event for graduates of all the, the practical uh, TV and film effects courses at universities around the country mm. that's held once a year. So an amazing showcase of people trying to keep those uh, techniques and bits and pieces alive, you know, practical, physical, real stuff. Yeah. Um, and we last year introduced the Jerry Anderson Film Miniature Award for what we think is the best film miniature on display. Um, and there must have been... 120 graduates there, Crikey. perhaps. Uh, I went around with Mark Willard, uh, who many may know from Terror Hawks and Dick mm -hmm. Spanner and New Captain Scarlet. Um, Mark worked with Dad for a very, very long time. They were very close. Uh, Mark has done a lot of practical stuff. And um, yeah, we went around. Uh, it was very, very tight. There are a couple of really, really good uh, film miniatures, but uh, Felix had done uh, a really, really stunning piece. Nice. Um, and actually, we clearly made the right choice because he went on to be best in show of the whole thing. Great. All so right. well done, Felix. It was really lovely work. But there's, there are lots of other people. Uh, another honourable mention to Marcus Dante, who was who was uh, one of our potential shortlist. He was really, really lovely as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so there you go. Uh, amazing stuff. And, um, you know, physical, real models yeah. and effects and miniatures yeah. are not dead there are yeah. uh, there's a whole new generation coming through and lots of them inspired by Jerry Anderson so that was yeah which is fantastic isn't it I mean that's you know that's another way in which which the name the legend lives on really isn't it is inspiring uh, the next generation in all sorts of fields which is uh, that's fantastic so yeah congratulations to Felix that's brilliant uh, now we do have an email from somebody as well. We did have indeed an email from Lewis. An email, an email. It's very early days, Jamie, isn't it? As you know, it's well that is true. And also, we've got loads to squeeze in. So even yes. if we had more emails, yeah, which we well, may have done, true enough. possibly. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go yeah. on, Richard. It's time for the listener email. So Lewis, <laughs> so Lewis got in touch with us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Uh, he says, "Hello, Richard and Jamie. Now I like that billing." That's much better billing than we have in the uh, the intro music at the top of the show. Well, do you know? You know, wherever I write it, I always write it in that order, Richard and Jamie. Quite right too. So he it says, "Hello, Richard and Jamie." That reverse the order for the announcement. So, mm, mm. honestly, uh, you you look anywhere, it says Richard yeah. James and Jamie Anderson. Yeah, everywhere. okay, all right. Uh, I just thought I'd <laughs> let you know, says Lewis, that I'm really enjoying the podcast. Well, that's a relief. So that's one. Uh, so keep up the good work, he says. Uh, I just thought you'd also like to know that I'm attempting to write a prequel for Thunderbirds based on Jeff uh, and the family setting up International Rescue. I'm just wondering, do you know of anything similar that is official? Uh, any comics or stories that have been written? Uh, and then he also says, my first memory of Jerry Anderson would be Thunderbirds, of course, when it was released in the 90s and early 2000s, and then continued on to Captain Scarlet and Stingray. He remembers having a VHS with three different episodes on from all three shows that he watched over and over again, and also used to love the adverts, uh, which showed all the toys you could get. Uh, so thank you, Lewis. That's a very nice memory of your um, Jerry Anderson experience growing up. Uh, so what about this, uh, the prequel for Thunderbirds based on Jeff and the family setting up International Rescue? Is there anything like that already out there? Do you know, Jamie? Well, my knowledge is not encyclopedic, of course, uh, but I'm fairly sure there was a 1990s comic uh, series of strips in the, in, the, well, in the 90s Thunderbirds comic, obviously, um, that dealt with the setup story. Right. I don't know... Well, I, I assume there is probably some fan uh, discussion slash disagreement about whether it ca it's canon or not. Yes. Um, but it certainly exists, and there may be some other bits and pieces uh, elsewhere. But I think there's... I have a feeling there's a, a website somewhere called something like the Thunderbirds Continuous Timeline. Oh, nice. I think, where somebody's yeah. tried to kind of collate yeah. everything that's ever, ever been produced from the TV series, the... TV21 comics through to the 90s, 2000 comics and beyond. So it might be worth looking up that, Lewis, but um, good luck. You see, it's a, it's a sprawling universe, isn't it, the Jerry Anderson universe? Even more so, perhaps, you might think, because with something like Doctor Who, uh, it, it's solely owned by the BBC, so you could say that anything that's sanctioned or produced by the BBC is canon. Whereas Jerry Anderson properties are owned by a thousand different companies, it seems, uh, from uh, you know from the old Luke Grade stuff to you know Mentorn for Space Precinct and all that sort of stuff. So it must mm. become a bit complicated trying to keep track of who's saying what about what series. Yeah, I think official canon stuff is, is yeah. 
yeah, always up for discussion slash yeah. dispute slash massive arguments. And of course, I should imagine there's plenty of fan fiction out there as well, which is always oh yeah, exciting. huge amounts. But yeah. I'll tell you what, we do. I do actually touch on this kind of um, multi-universe thing with mm-hmm. Lee Sullivan mm-hmm. because TV Twenty One uh, was was kind of at the time the publication that brought these universes together. Right. You know, it put Gordon Tracy into the world of Stingray. Right. Um, and I think crossed over Fireball and Stingray and Captain Scarlet and Thunderbirds. I mean, it, you know, that it was incredibly far-sighted of the team to mm. do that. Mm. But it was a way of saying there's a new series coming that mm. you don't know about yet and here's here's a vehicle from it in comic form. Oh, Lovely nice. thing to do. Anyway, yeah. so yeah, it's, it's always been happening, but... Who knows what yeah. the real kind of canon thing is. <laughs> yeah, indeed. But I uh, love your idea, Lewis. That's great. Uh, yeah, I love the idea of Jeff and, and the family setting up International Rescue. Now, if you have a question or a thought or a comment uh, that you'd like, to us, like us to consider, then you can drop us a line at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Uh, no question too small or large to consider. Because if we don't know, we know that other people listening will certainly know and will probably have an answer for you in the next episode. Yeah, but... If we don't know, you can be assured that we'll say so. <laughs> exactly. No <laughs> fake news here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, talking of Lee Sullivan, I think it's a bit uh, about time we heard a bit more from him, isn't it? Probably, yeah. I think so. Um, I had an, a nice chat with Lee in a bar in London somewhere. We got through a few beers. It was really nice. Yeah. Uh, so, as usual, because it was an out and about interview, there's some background noise. Yeah. Uh, apologies for that. A few clinking of glasses and uh, that sort of thing. But still, enjoy our chat. We cover all sorts of stuff, including... Uh... Is the dog still my in? Dogs. My dogs are barking, yeah. How rude. <laughs> anyway, because of that, let's go to the interview with Lee. Here he is. Right, well, my name is Lee Sullivan. Uh, I am a comic strip artist. And uh, in the past, I have worked on uh, various Jerry Anderson-related bits and pieces. I did five whole years uh, on Thunderbirds magazine for Redan Comics in I think the 1990s but it's all a bit of a blur um, and uh, so it was nice basic level comic strip work and then since then I've done some illustrations for uh, various other outlets more painting-y kind of things uh, currently I've been doing some work um, to do with the Captain Scarlet uh, anniversary whether it's 50 or 51 who knows these well days. it's 50 until September is so it okay right okay so it's still, still in the 50th and uh, so I've done some uh, uh, some artwork for the big chief studios uh, 12 inch figures um, there is a Captain Scarlet just figure one figure yeah uh, <laughs> of Captain Scarlet um, lots of illustrations for that uh, I worked a little bit with Mike Noble, great artist from TV oh, lovely 21. lovely Mike. Yeah. Uh, and um, we spend our best wishes to him because he's not terribly well at the minute. Yes, and, um, get well soon, Mike. And uh, so my privilege to work with him on that uh, and also uh, on a poster for Network uh, for their Blu-ray release <laughs> of, of Captain Scarlet. Uh, volume four, and we've got. I think we were on the cover of a mini comic and uh, and a poster as well for that. So. That's correct. Yes. God. Well, I. I I'm mean, up to date with my career. <laughs> you massive show off. I only wanted you to say I'm Lee Sullivan and I do some comic stuff and I've done Anderson bits, but instead you listed off all these amazing achievements. I want to get in first so that you know. You've done I, it. I can now leave. <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks for coming. It's um, been it's been swell. <laughs> I would I should also say if you're enjoying this contribution from Lee, uh, you should check out Fab Live episode. Is it ten you're on? God, it seems like it. <laughs> Where Lee co-hosted. It's on YouTube and Facebook. Yes. And uh, we got up to all sorts of things, including sniffing toys. Well, you know, vinyl <laughs> toys from the 1960s have a, a very special place in my heart. Not Nose. least because you can usually find a little aperture to sniff the uh, the long ago toxic released <laughs> I don't know where you're going with this Lee. no no, no I, I think it'll probably stop now <laughs> but you can sniff toys it's it's not illegal yet and and there's a certain amount of pleasure <laughs> <laughs> a bit weird though and you're yeah, always weird but yeah. it's you know it's it, it's, yeah. it's not uh, tree molesting or something so <laughs> So now people know the good and the bad, yes. and the ugly yes. about you. Yes. Um, 
I like to find out when people first saw their very first Anderson thing. Well, I guess I would normally have said supercar, uh, but I think probably Torchy is really the first thing I saw. I can't Torchy. remember. I can't remember Four Feather Falls. That's just not in my on my radar. But the earliest stuff were things like Torchy and Supercar. Supercar was absolutely obsessed by it. I mean, Torchy was great. I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed his um, his funny little hat. <laughs> and Mr. Bumbledrop. <laughs> Mr. Bum. Yeah, and a brilliant spaceship it was clearly a forerunner of a fireball. Uh, the, the, the nose oh, yeah. and all that stuff. Uh, it, and but when it got into Supercar, suddenly it was it clicked with all the kind of um, the mechanical stuff, all the all the vehicles, the the idea that you were you had roof doors. In I I couldn't. I used my dad had made a lovely garage. He was a carpenter and a, a model maker of, of lovely um, flying aircraft, uh, little rubber driven aircraft, and. Um, and he made me a, a garage to put my dinky toys in and it had some sliding doors and so I had I inverted the garage so that it stood on its end and the, the sliding front doors were now the roof doors and my little star fighter uh, craft tea away you as well, sir? yeah that's all done yeah, thank, thank you very much we'll, we'll have no more of that tea thank no you. it's all beer now <laughs> beer yeah. all the way no. the gloves are off now <laughs> Thank you. You'll probably edit this out, won't you? No, I'm going to leave it in. Oh, good. Leave it in, totally. Because this is the life that uh, you know people aspire to, isn't it? Cafe society. <laughs> Hotel bars society. <laughs> Hotel bars. Brilliant. Uh, so, you inverted your garage. I inverted your garage. my garage and a garage. A garage. Garage, really, because I come from Luton. Yeah. And, um, uh, it was a. Uh, I had a little Starfighter, which was the only thing. It was a little tiny aircraft with nacelles on the wings, and it was a bit supercarish. It had a lovely little cockpit, a bit like supercar, and it was the only thing I had which was like supercar. So I used to have that fly out through the uh, inverted garage, and um, and then my mum and dad bought me the toys, and then it just accelerated from there. And now I, my house is crammed full of toys. I've seen pictures of your shelves. They are groaning. They're not quite as groaning as they were actually, because I had to get—I got rid of some just recently. That fireball that in, that's in the uh, podcast—it's gone now. Really? So, yeah. It broke my heart, but I wanted some other fireball stuff. And that's, <laughs> that's how I got it. And you got some more interesting fireball. Stuff. I got some more interesting yeah. fireball stuff. And I thought I can always buy that again later. Yeah. Perhaps off the same guy if he doesn't get rid of it first. Buy it back again. <laughs> but so, yeah. So, so it was your first supercar toilet the budgie? supercar then mm. is that the one yeah my belief my memory is that my mum and dad bought me for Christmas or my birthday they're about six months apart um, they bought me both the Plaston supercar the vinyl one which I love to smell <laughs> and the budgie supercar they bought me both at the right. same time and presented them to me on, on whatever occasion it was and I loved them to death basically and so by the time the next six months had rolled past they actually bought me the both of them again and I I promptly destroyed those as well over a period of time I've got fragments of the budgie nothing I, I, Lord knows what happened to the soup the, the plaston but I've bought all of them again since so I have a fine collection of um, sniffable uh, vinyl <laughs> uh, toys from the 1960s as they chemically decay <laughs> The so, gift that Steve keeps giving. Obviously. <laughs> you can have toxic budgie syndrome. Or yeah, toxic. yeah. Oh, toxic. Well, yeah. yeah oh, that's gross. Cruise, isn't it? Uh, anyway. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, so that was it. And then Fireball XL5 came out. And suddenly all my supercars had to double as Fireball XL5. It's a funny thing because there's this fickleness. I mean, yeah. I absolutely worshipped supercar. And Fireball came along and that was supercar pushed to one side and I used to try to pretend that the because the the wings on supercar are kind of similar to fireball and the but two fins a bit of a problem that so yeah. I used to try and with the plaston I used to take off two fins and put one in the middle with sellotape 
And that was my fireworks. <laughs> oh, it's it's almost Dickensian, isn't it? it and it's is, absolutely poor shocking. Thing. Yeah, I know. But I got the fireball. I mean, I got Kitmaster fireball pretty quick. Dad made that for me. Um, I seem to have an olfactory obsession because one of the things about that was my dad painted it with these Humbrol paints, mm. and the curing of them, the smell was just fabulous, and it. It, it stays in my head even now. Yeah. And I don't know why that's important, but it. A sad no, a, lot of me- a lot of memory is tied to smell. So. Yes. <laughs> um, no, well, I, I remember speaking to, I think, Eddie Izzard. All right. He okay. said Thunderbirds for him was inextricably linked with the smell of roast dinners. Mmm. So, it, yeah, it happens. Did you, did you know that at the time, as, or did you appreciate as a kid, or you were aware that Fireball was by the same people as Supercar. Was there any kind of connection in your head? Or did you literally just go, this is better than Supercar, I'm watching this now? I think that I was aware of the whole, um, uh, I'm sure I was aware of the Anderson name because my mum and dad would read me credits even if I could, I mean, I could read quite early on anyway, but, but um, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I was almost seven by the time I could read perfectly well. By the, uh, <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm, I, I know I knew that they were the same people, and I knew that Space Patrol wasn't the same people. Okay. I, I'm a big fan of Space Patrol. Before anyone gets starts throwing darts at me, because it has connections anyway. It has yeah, the, uh, the, the the Arthur Provis connection, right, exactly, and Roberto Lee, I suppose. Yeah, and and also it was, but it was a totally different take on the same kind of subject. Yeah, and I, I really enjoyed. That and I was, I, you know, I, I was a big fan of that stuff. Um, but Fireball was so I, I, I can remember being totally visually obsessed by it. I could because the one of the great things about shows is the repetition. So mm. that you know, you you have the same thing week after week, so to, to reinforce it. And I think that that's really important. And, yep. Um, and you know, you ignore that with kids at your peril. They love to see the same thing over and over again because it, it just builds the world. They know where they are with it, and then the, the adventures can sit on top of all that stuff, you know. Um, but Fireball go down, going to, I mean, I knew when I was going to see the little particular sparks coming out the back of it, you know. It, it's so, <laughs> it, it, it was so, you know, ingrained in my head. And I still, to anyone who will listen, I still think one of the most magical moments in any kids TV show is when you see the view behind Steve and Robert as XL5 is taking off and the sky darkens and becomes night and the stars come yep. out it's such a clever idea and it, and it's so visually effective and it and I, I really felt I was in space you know it, it built my generation were all going to be astronauts there's no doubt about it um, you know, we just thought that's how it was going to be. You know, there would be flying cars by now, and uh, instead of cars that I could no longer actually understand how to drive, uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of glad flying cars didn't happen, um, <laughs> so I'd be crashing into things, um, but on a different level, and um, <laughs> another dimension. So another speak. dimension. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> Oh, God, I don't know where I was. Oh, yeah, so we were all going to be astronauts, and, um, uh, and Fireball was just hit that lovely crest of the wave mm. for my generation, where Steve was fantastically handsome, and it is, Robert was... I loved Robert. I could take or leave Venus, but Robert... <laughs> I still love Robert. I think yeah. it's just a marvellous thing. There were some wonderful annuals. There's a wonderful annual... Uh, that I think this is probably the second one or maybe the first but there's a story about them finding an old broken down version of Robert uh, yeah different robot yeah and them communicating with each other it was desperately sad I, oh. I just remember and because that but that's an important thing about all those things and, and particularly how where a bit of my work comes into it is that the TV shows were great really fabulous but they were also springboards for these incredible extra things, the, the TV21 extensions of those worlds, actually pushed them well beyond what the television shows gave you mm. and were able to show you things that, that you know, in much more kind of uh, glamorous colour and uh, bigger sets and, and all that stuff. 
uh, than the, the TV shows could hope to do. But they were all connected, and and it, it meant that by the time the comics came out, TV 21 came out and absolutely pulled all those worlds together. It was a fabulous thing to do. And I, really, I lived through one of the best periods to be a kid because I grew up exactly the right age for each successive Anderson series. Doctor Who had started as well. Uh, the Daleks were on, and I was obsessed with those. They were in TV 21 as well by some magical uh, thing. <laughs> they were, yeah. The Daleks were there. And, um, and so my whole world was was those programs but actually when the comics started they were united by that the comics and the comics were weekly they didn't go away for periods of time they didn't get replaced by something else you had you still had supercar stingray fireball xl5 you know all those things that, that and you know i can remember them kind of saying thunderbirds is coming and that was the most amazing time. Yeah, they sort of pre, pre so they were pre-launching shows in TV21. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And what a clever idea mm. they did with Scarlet as well. I mean, I, I don't know when they started doing it, but it's it certainly with Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds, Lady Penelope's comic strip was out way before the. I think way before. I may be wrong. It's maybe poor memory, but I believe she had a comic strip before the show started. And uh, I thought her name was Penelope. <laughs> and, and I also thought that Parker was her shuffler. Because <laughs> although like, I could read, I wasn't series. reading exactly the correct please. <laughs> Bless you. Bless Used to be lady, like, oh, just do a bit of shuffling for you now, <laughs> lady. <laughs> Maybe in the sort of after dark TV21 strip. <laughs> um, yeah. Fantastic. So, you, so XL5, you were, st you were starting to read TV21 when you were watching that then? I'm uh, sure you said about, or is it Mike Noble that said about the gold Fireball XL5? Because he only, he, he's, I'm sure he said that when he was given the job... Oh, no, that's right, yeah, yeah. He, they, he only saw a publicity photo that was a funny colour. Yes. And he thought it, it was gold. Yeah, that's right, and, then he, and he still does it gold. It's fantastic. Fantas I, I love the fact that he's just he's going to stick with that forever, because yeah. it's his XL5. Um, and I always thought it was gold as well, because I'd seen it in the comics. But actually, the first, the first time... Uh, TV21 comes along after TV Comic. TV Comic had started a strip on Doctor Who around about, probably around about the same time as the Daleks. Oh, see, I can't quite sort this out. I'd have to research this a bit more. But they're sort of around the same time. But Fireball XL5 was drawn by Neville Main uh, in TV21, uh, sorry, in TV Comic before TV21 got a hold of it. Mm. Um, and Neville Main was also the first. Doctor Who artist, comic strip artist, um, and he—he's a great chap. <laughs> you can't—you could never say about him that he dwelt on his drawings. Um, he just smashed them out, and they're, they are very, very basic, with a tremendous dash, uh, and uh, and and really great stuff. But they all look very, very strange-looking people in them. Um, and it suited Fireball XL5 quite well. well. They managed to make Steve look a bit ugly. Um, and, uh, and Venus too, actually. Oh dear. He made them all look... I mean, they're all on the sort of same level as the Lazoon, you know, Zuni. They all looked about the same kind of species. <laughs> uh, as did John and Gillian uh, in the Doctor Who strip, which he created as well. But it was great, very simplistic art and, and great stuff. But enough to fire your imagination and keep you reading the comics. Yeah, but, but TV21 blew TV comic out of the water and mm. was... Although I followed the Doctor Who strip in TV21, uh, TV comic, TV21 was miles ahead right from the word go. And, and a, an amazing piece of um, publishing, really. Because it was... It, it, it's such a great conceit that you have a newspaper from the future that kids can read because at that time people don't read newspapers anymore really except to show off I think but uh, they, they, you know, they sit around in, in waiting rooms reading newspapers uh, I don't use a mobile phone you know I should add that Lee was reading newspaper when I arrived exactly showing off that is, of course, a lie, but it's a very acceptable one, and, and, and it paints a better picture of me than it I... Feels fitting, yeah, exactly. It? Um, but it was a wonderful conceit, because you had... Um, kids uh, would be able to emulate their parents, uh, which they do a lot of, you know, that, you know, I used to have a steering wheel 
plastic steering wheel that used to attach to the dashboard of the front of our car. I have one too. <laughs> Great fun. And, and it was a tremendous aid if you ever had a crash because you could hold on to the plastic steering wheel and, uh, and, and as you flew through the window, you'd have something to hold on to. Because um, no seat belts. Um, of course. Fantastic oh, days. It was to what a, what a golden time that was. Yeah. Best time to be a kid, like you said. <laughs> it was. It might be short and sweet, but you know, you had fun as you were flying through the air. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so I mean, there's that aspect to it that, that kids would kind of think, okay, I've got a grown up thing. And it, and it didn't pander, it didn't talk down to the kids. It was Datelines 2063, 64, 5, whatever it was. Um, and you could just think, this is, I am getting my messages from the future, and all these great things are all actually happening out there, and you're connected with it, and you've got, you know, photographs. And that's another revolutionary thing to actually have fairly regular. Some of the comic strip people are a bit annoyed about this, but there were, there were photographs stuck into the middle of comic strips. And that added, to me, it added a sense of realism. Because mm. thought, oh, it is actually Stingray. You know, I, I appreciate that this lovely man, Embleton, is drawing these lovely Stingrays. But that's an actual photograph of Stingray right in the middle there. And there are photographs of Marineville on the cover. And, you know, Marineville goes into Clampdown or whatever the, the story was. The fantastic, fantastic way of, of drawing all the threads together and making the kids totally buy into a world, I think really fantastic idea and it's very hard to do that uh, hard to imagine it really happening again because it's so it was so all-encompassing television was the thing there was nothing else there was no there were literally nothing else for kids really it was tv or playing in the garden yeah or maybe um, the occasional mini album yes the mini albums oh yeah we had to have a record player it took me a while to i missed the mini albums because i didn't have a record player really? yeah yeah well, I did. I had a, <laughs> I had a, a wonderful battery-operated device, uh, record-playing device, which um, was um, which played Polly Wally Doodle. Uh, but that was about it, really. I, I don't think the mini albums could have survived it at 33 and a third. <laughs> They've been going around at 78, I think. <laughs> They've been very short episodes. It would have upped the drama and the action, though, yeah. wouldn't it? <laughs> and the octaves of all, all the actors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that was. But those are the things. But but TV was absolutely ruled, and it certainly ruled my life. Um, um, and it ruled my parents' life as a result. But that tying it in, tying in a publication, and I think the sales for TV Twenty One were enormous. There were millions. A million, million a week. Yeah. Yeah. Which is massive. Uh, now you, you well, well you, you definitely don't get that now in magazines. Yeah. In you, comics, no chance. Ridiculous. Well, you, you'd be hard pushed to actually get a TV program to get much more beyond that. And that's that's an extraordinary state yeah. of affairs. You know? yeah. So much TV now. But um, it was it was a great time because, like I say, one, one series followed another. And they got more and more sophisticated as my own limited child experience the world was getting more and more um, experienced and sophisticated with it and by t the time Captain Scarlet came along you know I, I know I welcomed the whole getting them in the proper scale the, the, the heads being in the right scale to the body um, the extreme attention to detail mm. but I also knew that it was less dynamic and that was simply from the mechanics of yeah, yeah. trying to trying to make puppets walk. And I, I I always thought that was a funny thing about your dad that that he, he hated the way they walked and and it was always a problem. But actually, nobody really thinks that. Actually. No, no, nobody really. <laughs> Everybody's minds fine about that. Isn't it? But that was tied into his des like desperation to improve the whole thing, all the the technology around it, the technique. Do you think that it was? Oh, because he always wanted to be doing adult stuff. Mm. Do you think it was that he was desperate? If he wasn't going to get to work on those adult things, he was going to damn well make the children's stuff as adult as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, yeah, as adult as possible, <clears throat> moving towards live action mm. as much as possible. So obviously the scarlet proportion change is part of that. Yeah. And then Secret Service's inclusion of humans is another step closer towards it again. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, although not necessarily the best not totally result. successfully, but... Not totally, but no, you can say it was that. A, but you see, that was a completely um, mysterious series to me because it didn't air on the region. I was, I was in the 
Anglia region possibly, or, or London, whichever it was, and, and it didn't have Secret Service. No. And also, Lost we didn't get didn't. UFO for some months um, until I had the two novels of UFO and an annual of UFO. I knew all about UFO, but I just couldn't see the bloody program. Yeah. <laughs> it's heartbreaking. <laughs> That's the weird thing about the ITV regions that we don't think about now. And also, because where I live, you could get both. It just depended on where your aerial was pointed. Oh. And so some of the kids at school were watching UFO, and it wasn't me. Oh. I yeah, know. more evidence of a deprived childhood. Oh, yeah, that and missing the first episode of Captain Scarlet. God. Why, I don't, why, I don't why did you know. miss that? I don't know what happened there. There was probably some terrible clerical error on behalf of my mother and father, uh, and they took me out somewhere, I imagine. Um, Selfish. How could they? That's the sort of cruelty that used to go on back then. <laughs> uh, I think I, I missed the Patrick Troughton last episode as well of Doctor Who. Same reasons. Oh, really? Yeah, they were just... Now, as it was I, I've been talking to, to Nick Briggs. All right. He said that he missed... Dear Nick. He missed the first two episodes of the War Games. Right, okay. So he could watch Joe 90, I think. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah. Okay. Because they were competing, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. I'd forgotten that. Yeah, did you ever have that that. issue in the house of BBC versus ITV, Doctor Who versus whatever Anderson thing was on? Well... And if so, who would win? Oh! Loaded question there. Well, um... It would depend what it was. Uh, Oh, interesting. It would depend what it was. Doctor Who was such a religion to me that I couldn't really tear myself away from it. I don't know. I, I, I must have been. I, I mean, Lord knows, they couldn't have. Over, they, I might have been watching both because one was uh, one of these were the Thunderbirds, mm, not Scarlet, not not Joe Knighty. They're half-hour programs. If they were running side by side, I don't know how I could have watched them both, but I did. So um, there was obviously some jiggery pokery went on there. <laughs> I was glued to all of them, um, but I missed the first Scarlet. And the funny thing was, I, I was desperate to know what's the music like. What's the music like? Mm. And uh, these guys at school say, oh yeah, it's, uh, it goes like, uh, Captain Scarlet, Captain Scarlet, da 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 which is not Captain Scarlet at all. It's the, uh, it's the bloody bird's eye, Captain Bird's eye theme. Bird's eye? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's what they could remember. So for, you know, oh dear. And I think also, and so then the bubblegum cards came out of Captain Scarlet. And so I would see images of the Mistron City, and just, I hadn't seen it. I well, missed, that? All, that, missed it? all the Mistron City. Oh. Oh. Cruelty. Poor you. I know. So when you were watching these things obsessively and religiously... Well, I, I think not obsessively. I think in a, in a, in a restrained and uh, critical... <laughs> when you were critically appreciatively watching these things, yeah. were, you, were you starting to draw then? Were you drawing what you were seeing, or did the drawing come later? No, the drawing was pretty much as soon as I could get hold of a pencil. And um, the earliest drawings I've got, actually, the earliest drawings, full stop, I've got are of Fireball XL5 and Supercar. And I think they're both drawn in a Rupert Bear annual. Amazing. Because you wouldn't have, there wasn't, I mean, my mum and dad had paper, but a lot of that was thrown away, Mm. the, the first drawings I did. But the annuals, of course, I kept. And so I've got, I've got a Rupert Bear annual with, very elongated Fireball XL5s and, and very elongated supercars. Right. With all the right components in, but they were oh, just okay. stretched. <laughs> Massively stretched. And, it, what? and pictures of Daleks on hoverbouts as well, isn't it? Amazing. So uh, you, technically you could say that you owe your entire career to Jerry Anderson. Yes, I, I could. and. Uh, I'd be happy to. <laughs> That's not an unfair. Is it? No, because not, obviously, obviously, you know, your your ongoing friendship with Mike Noble and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Mike clearly had a massive impact. Yeah, but it's nice to know that it's sort of rooted in. Oh no, it, and Doctor it, Who. It, it, it's 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 rooted in the programmes um, and the comic strips and the the annuals. The annuals are very important because they. They were things you could return to time and time again easily, whereas comics you stack up and they're kind of hard to get to after a bit. Um, <laughs> I have virtually all of the TV21s now, which again I'd got rid of at some stage. And 
I love them. I love having them. It's it's a treat to have them. But you can't get you know that even if you only stack them 50 high, you can't get to them very easily. Yeah. So um, uh, the annuals are very important. Um, but the programs were really the thing that the, the magic of them and the music. Uh, the, the, I mean, everyone knows how it, magical the. Uh, Barry Gray's music was and how Absolutely. important it was to the, the whole thing um, and, it, and it elevated what could have been you know an okay series into an absolutely top class feature film kind of level music and um, I know your dad said about his he couldn't understand why Barry Gray hadn't done more film work because his music was so filmy I guess it's tight casting in the in the way that things happened in those days. Yeah. Now he'd be doing everything. He'd be he'd be the Hans Zimmer. Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. And um, so all those elements were were fabulous. And all the, of course, all the design work and and the model work and the puppeteering and all that stuff. You become to appreciate more the older you get. Um, but it was terrifically exciting and. and oh. You know, it, it was everything. My, but my whole career, I, I didn't really. I mean, when I was younger, I thought I will become, I will do this, this stuff that I'm looking at here. That's what I'll do because I didn't know there was anything else. So I thought I'd do that. And uh, by the time I got to college, it had kind of um, stopped being. I, I just thought, well, maybe that's not something I will do. I couldn't really see how to get into it. Yeah. So I decided that. Uh, uh, that I would become an illustrator and I got a bit more grown up about thinking about it and so and I went to a, a college foundation art course and then a technical uh, um, uh, found, uh, God, what do they call it a vocational course uh, which was about illustration but that was much more about nuts and bolts really literally uh, technical illustration plus wildlife illustration but working for the adult market and the whole comics thing kind of faded away for me um, in a way that uh, is slightly amazing to me now because I, I just didn't follow my star, really. Uh, but in a way, it was kind of okay because the kind of, the kind of things I learned becoming an illustrator that did that kind of work, airbrush work, technical work, uh, wildlife work, all kinds of advertising work, um, gave me a much better grounding when I came to finally work in comics about how to draw stuff, really. I mean, yeah. cars and aeroplanes and wheels. perspective and wheel wheels. Oh yeah, ellipses. My word, they're the thing. So that uh, all that training stood you in good all stead. All that training stood me in good stead. And then I, after a while, I started to think I'd really like to do comics again. And I happened to bump into a guy through a, a, a an art a local art shop. I knew that this guy was looking for someone to be basically an assistant with lettering and things like that and his name is John Higgins and he's a, a well respected uh, artist these days well he was then um, and uh, in 2000 AD and Razor Jack and all those kind of things well without end lots of stuff John's done really great illustrator colour illustrator dynamic illustrator and a very good guy because he took me in to Marvel UK uh, and basically showed my stuff to them and I suddenly found myself doing covers for Transformers. And Transformers led very fast into doing, uh, well, actually Transformers led after about a year for me being brave enough to start doing comic strips, not just covers for them. And then once I'd got the hang of that, I, I almost catapulted into doing Doctor Who, um, which is what I'd always wanted to be doing, one of the things I'd always wanted to do. And then I was off being a comic strip artist finally. And then happily later on, um, uh, Richard Starkings, I have to mention here because I have to, it's con I'm contracted, contractually obliged to mention Richard Starkings. He basically shaped my career. He's he's a bit like the monolith in 2001. Every time there's a lull, he appears, and then things change. You know, and, and, <laughs> and he's done that for my career each way through, including Rivers of London, which is working on now. He, he's always sort of there to suggest me to someone who needs something doing. And uh, the editor at the time on Thunderbirds uh, magazine, Redan, was um, uh, was looking for someone, I think, I think they were trying to use Steve Kite and that wasn't working out because they, frankly, they didn't want to pay anybody any money, I think. 
uh, but I was desperate at the time. <laughs> We've had this conversation since Steve and I. Uh, so he's, he's, he, 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 wasn't, he was unruffled by the whole thing. Very but, good, um, glad to hear that. Uh, but um, we, um, so I, I, I got Thunderbirds to, and it was great to do it. I really loved the fact I was doing it, and I spent a lot of time trying to get the machinery looking right um, and accurate as, as I could. Um, it was aimed at a slightly too young. I was sort of back into Neville Main territory almost, mm. with um, with much more simplistic artwork, uh, which also reflected the amount of money they were paying. So it's one of those things where you kind of cut your cloth according to uh, what you've got. And um, uh, I, but it was great to work on it. But all the time I was thinking, oh, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, and I am producing a rather you know this is not what I should be doing with this really well I did it for five years because like you know you need to pay the bills not that happy. bad and, 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 and subsequently I've met guys who kind of grew up on it and of course they loved it uh, well the ones that speak to me do uh, and um, and they, they were uh, you know it, it had the same effect on them that the TV21 stuff did on me it's just that it, it's on a different <laughs> level of, of storytelling um, so that was it was nice to work on that but I was very pleased when I got to do some uh, re there were some reprint titles Marcus Hearn yep. was doing a, a reprint title and I did a cover for him and that was the first time I did a sort of more my kind of stuff you know for, for that and it was great because I was so thrilled that it, the, the book contained uh, some of Mike Noble's work and I was terribly pleased about that because I didn't know Mike then but I loved his work and then subsequently I bumped into Mike and now we're friends and we've worked together and that's that's tremendous but it was the start of me doing stuff of a more uh, gritty level for for, for for the Anderson Empire I was going to say Anderson verse then the, Anders the Anderverse and, or Andyverse Andyverse is, um, is it Andyverse? Rufus Hound calls it that yeah. Andyverse right okay yeah. Anderson verse whatever hmm. the world's going Anderson there you go um so you've contributed quite a lot to the Anderson verse, the Anderson, Anderson whatever it is, <laughs> yeah. to the worlds of Jerry Anderson over your well, career. Yeah, I mean, it, I've been very lucky to have worked on it because I, I've had a lot of luck in my career in that I've tended to end up working on things that I quite like um, rather than I, you know having long stretches on things that I didn't have any interest in. Um, uh, and of course to go back and revisit your childhood with all this stuff and it allows me to buy toys that I perhaps wouldn't get away with otherwise yep the old the old vinyl um, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know the Anderson stuff, stuff is is terribly important and I'm very I can't tell you how thrilled I was to do there were actually several things that I did a for the comic back in the 90s whenever I used to do these drawings. They used to do. Occasionally, they would do. They would. There would always be a toy. The basically the way it works is a toy has a comic attached to it, so that they can get it into the shops. That's the way round it works. Um, that, I mean, it really literally Cynical, does work. Eh? Well, it's just that's just how it is. Um, they couldn't sell those toys anyway normally, but they, if they can get them in there and it's tied in, there you go. And that's great, because that's, there's a comic attached, and if the comic's good, then, then hooray for everyone. Um, but I did some, they occasionally would do uh, customised things, so I did some, there were some spinners of each of the Thunderbirds, and they were like little frisbees, basically, with a, a little drawing of the Thunderbird in the middle. But they, they took my flat drawings, and they sculpted them into, into relief. And I just thought that was the best thing ever, that I'd got this little toy, you know, that was actually, you know, a proper toy that I'd done some work on. Um, and because I love toys and the, the great fun of working on the Big Chief stuff is that <laughs> I now have uh, Scott and Virgil looking down at me over my shoulder in the studio. And I've done the box artworks for all the, the Tracy boys and Scarlett. And to be attached to a toy, they're not toys really, but but a replica uh, of, the, of the of the puppets, albeit a scale replica, um, 
they I, I don't know, couldn't that's career highlight for me and working for with Mike as well that was a, astonishing because he's a genius Mike Noble is one of the most I, I, I don't know if he's underrated or not he's underrated I think by the public because they don't know his name in the same way that they know yeah. um, Bellamy and Embleton he doesn't have that name but he's he's so good and uh, uh, speaking as from a professional point of view I, his work is almost seamless there's nothing wrong with it and even when he gets things wrong they look so good they might as well not be wrong whereas most artists can't get away with that yeah uh, and he doesn't really get things wrong most of the time, actually. But he's just, he's so good, such a good artist, such a good draftsman, so skilled at doing all the colour stuff. Um, and even in black and white, the Captain Scarlet strips that are in black and white, they still look like they're in colour but photographed in black and white. But they're, they're remarkable things. Yeah. And my stuff is really, really beautiful. And he's such a nice man and, so, and oh. always so self deprecating. He's underappreciated by himself, really. No, absolutely. My favourite thing, really, is to constantly tell him how good he is. Because <laughs> he doesn't I'm, know what to do with it. He doesn't know what to do with it, yeah. <laughs> and it's true. And I keep saying, no, but Mike, you're a genius. I said to him, I said, you're probably the greatest living comic strip artist at the moment. I bet you he loves that. No, well, he doesn't really believe it. And the thing is, but he's, and he's very bashful, but I just think that um, my gift to him is, because I, you know... God, I can't do anything else. But is to say to him how appreciated he is, mm. and he loves to hear it actually because he worked in such isolation back in the day, uh, particularly because he was looking after his mother at the time, who was uh, he just had to look after her, and um, and so he was doing this crashing amount of work and looking after her, and he didn't really get a chance to experience the pleasure of meeting the audience and things were different then there were no conventions yeah, of course so it's nice to be able to sort of say every now and again hey Mike you know top 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 artist yeah. I, and I keep saying I'm not really fit to walk into the same house as you <laughs> but I'll come in anyway because I have got a bit of an ego I don't know if you've noticed folks but you know, <laughs> if no, it didn't shine all. through already no absolutely not <laughs> um he sung Mike's praises, justifiably so, because his stuff is is beautiful. Yeah, uh, it, it, um, it all kind of ha hangs off the the universe, the wider universe, the TV Twenty One universe, Absolutely, all the yeah. stuff in there. Because you've got such a broad and deep appreciation of the TV shows and TV Twenty One, I think you might be better placed to answer this question than most people. Pressure on now, Lee. Okay. You can see the sweat dripping. Give on his me brow the now. question. It is, if you can, if you can, in a couple of sentences, can you define what it is? What is the the Jerry Anderson spirit that is imbued in all of those shows that gives them that appeal? Because they they do stand out that group of productions against any other. Even as a child, like you said, when you watched Supercar through to Fireball, you may not have known the names necessarily, but you knew they were connected. Oh, yeah. It came from the same place. So what, what do you think that spirit is? I think... Uh, I actually have thought about this, surprisingly. Um, I think it's, he's a kind of... Uh, your dad and the production company, and your dad and, uh, and, and Sylvia, and all those people... They had a similar kind of approach to these things that Isengard Kingdom Brunel had in his period, which was utterly, utter swagger to come at something completely full tilt and do it as well as you can, but do it preposterously so that you have Thunderbirds. I mean, just, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? There's, there's, these wonderful uh, sequences of ludicrously huge machines crawling out of hangars massively slowly and palm trees having to get out of the way. The preposterousness of that, it's the swagger, it's, it's saying that, that think big, that they were really big ideas with big solutions to, to big ideas. And I think that, that the design, the music, the, the, 
costume design, uh, the the type of adventures they were, uh, you know, into into UFO UFOs time. You've got you know the. I just love the fact that he goes into his office and the office goes underground. It's, it doesn't... There could just be an elevator. There's no need for the office no. to go down. But that doesn't stop them doing it. And that's the, it's the swagger. It's doing unnecessary things to make them look as if they're necessary and do it in the most dynamic way possible because that is a, a, a door to magic land. It's, it's going through the wardrobe to Narnia. You're going into a world where that sort of stuff just doesn't happen, you know. There's a great picture of Isambard Kingdom Brunel standing in front of some chains uh, for one of the massive boats. He, <laughs> I don't care about the, the, the physics of it. I'm going to build iron boats and I'm going to put whacking great chains on them. And the chains are like six foot, each link is six foot long. And you just think, they just didn't care. They would just do it. I, we don't know if we could do this or not, but we're going to try anyway. Yeah. And I think that all of the Thunderbirds... Uh, all of the Anderson stuff is is has got that same kind of swagger to it, and you know it, it, that's why it appeals so much I think, to me. That is a very nice, hefty summary, <laughs> appropriately so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 you come at you come at it from a different perspective yeah, because sure. because of the visual yeah. stuff and the detail and the, the attention you paid to the detail, I guess. Um, Lee, as ever, you've been brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> if people want to find you, ah. where can they do that? Don't give away your home address just before you do that. Oh, I, I wouldn't mind if they came round. Uh, well, there you go. Open invite to Lee's house. Yeah, in uh, the garden. Just yeah. Put your tents up and I'll be... Yeah, we'll t- bring out the coffee. For Barbecue. You. <laughs> uh, but if, if they want to find you online, where do they find you, Lee? Uh, well, they'll find me on... Oh, now you're actually asking a question I'm not entirely sure I can deliver the, the answer to. Uh, I can answer why Jerry Anderson stuff was so great. Um, but my own website, hmm, more difficult. Uh, I think it's Lee Sullivan dot co dot uk or it's lee sullivan art dot co dot uk try both of those and you'll be try is uh, you just, might be okay. if you just google me i'm there instantly i'm i yeah. you know certainly on my own house uh it's the first thing that comes up on google right <laughs> <laughs> also facebook i have a i i i, I have an art uh, an art page on facebook but i have a personal Facebook page, and I love interacting with people on that. So uh, come along and say hello. You'll accept anyone on that. I will. I've had them all. Right. Well, there you go. What an amazing uh, <laughs> opportunity there. Yes. Uh, right, Lee. You may be disappointed, but you know, I'll try my best. We're never disappointed in you, Lee. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Enjoy your beer. Cheers. My pleasure. Cheers. Oh, Lee. Great. Isn't lovely. Wasn't that, yeah, wasn't that great? He speaks with such passion, doesn't he, about the about the Jerry Anderson and what, what Jerry means to him. It's lovely. Yeah, well, you can really tell that how much of an effect it's had on his career and his life as a whole. I mean, the yeah. fact that he is still, you know, at his age. At his uh, well, age, at his he's, he's there age. With, with, with shelves full of toys and he's still sniffing them. And, yes. you know, those happy memories of... Yes. Uh, of growing up with TV Twenty One and all that sort of stuff. It's, yes. Yeah. Now we have we have personal experience of uh, of sniffing Lee's toys, don't we? When we did, we when he joined us for Fab Live at some point last year. Yes. So if you'd like to see Lee sniffing toys, you know, live, well, <laughs> who wouldn't? Live, then um, you can check out that episode of Fab Live. Just search on Google or whatever Fab Live Lee Sullivan. I think. It's yeah. Up. We should. I mean, we should just mention that uh, for those of you that don't know, Fab Live is our monthly. Uh, Facebook live broadcast that Jamie and I do from uh, various undisclosed locations, usually my house or his house. Uh, we try and aim for the first Monday of each month, but it's not always possible. Uh, but we no. do try and uh, try and do one a month, uh, and that goes out at seven o'clock on a Monday evening. Uh, and we sometimes have guests. We have um, people send us photographs um, and questions, and, uh, and we, we play games, we play don't games. we? We do fantastic uh, games. Yes, yes, indeed. So yes, uh, join us there too. Well, that was lovely. So yeah, so nice to have um, to have. Lee contributing and, and you've got some great names coming up as well I, I understand for future interviews yep certainly do I think as I mentioned we've got Network Distributing um, who I'm speaking to in a couple of weeks about their amazing restoration work mm-hmm. Wayne Forrester mm-hmm. uh, we've got some archive material coming up from great. Dad and from uh, a few other people that worked with him back in the 60s who are no longer with us Yeah, it's lovely to have those sort of things uh, and lots more besides lots of people to speak to but if you've yeah. got an idea of somebody we should be speaking to 
drop us a line at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and we will try to line up that sort of interview obviously we'll be speaking to the you know the big voices and the people that you know and love from anderson tv past but yeah. also people who are fans people who uh, kind of work in connected industries e- even nick dwyer I think that's, that's Nick's surname of the Beaver Town Brewery, right? Uh, which is a lovely little brewery in London. They make great stuff. But Nick is the creative director there, and he's his work is inspired by Thunderbirds. Oh, how so wonderful! Kind of, we're really kind of way outside the usual box, but yeah. really interesting people. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it'd be nice to hear from people like that. That's lovely. And what do people do if they don't want to miss it, Richard? Well, if they don't want to miss it, of course, they can subscribe. So you can find us on iTunes, you can find us on Stitcher, you can find us on Spotify. Uh, you can subscribe, you can rate, please. Give us your uh, your ratings and, and a couple of words of, uh, of in a review would be nice. Uh, and yeah, tell your friends. So yes, do subscribe to us uh, and uh, rate and review. Do all, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, all that is. stuff. Uh, I think it's time for another feature is it now? Richard, yeah. What could that possibly be? Well, I'm thinking something like uh, Chris Dale with something maybe called uh, The Randomizer. That's yeah. like a good name, doesn't it? Well, I, you know, he had a good episode last week, so let's hope he has something good um, this time as well. Good luck, Chris. A new computer. What game are those supply guys playing? They delivered one last week. Get on a transport, will you, Atlanta? Ask him to move it. Yes, sir. Actually, Commander Shaw, that... Gosh, you have a lot of stairs here. That's mine. That's the, uh... That's the randomizer. It's used to select Jerry Anderson episodes at random for me to review on the podcast. I was hoping I could record this week's episode right here in the control tower. Oh, please go right ahead. Don't let us get in your way. Well, thank you. I... Oh, you're being sarcastic. I know that, you dunderhead. But, Commander Shaw... You'll be on the official Jerry Anderson podcast. It'll make you all look good, and if I may say so, it might help make me look good too. The only way you could look good is to get a complete new face. Well, that that's passive-aggressive, and I'm getting the impression you'd really rather I did this elsewhere. You still here? Okay, fine, fine. I understand. I'll do this uh, out in the corridor then. Uh, Commander, would you mind getting the door for me? Please, get out! I'm going, I'm going. Oh, thank goodness I had wheels fitted to this thing. What in the name of thunder was that? Well, I'm sorry, everybody. As you can see, I'd hoped to do this from the control room, but I guess we'll have to settle for the corridor outside the control room instead. Oh, I haven't even got a guest to push the button for me this week. Hmm? Oh, hello. Can I help you? Oh, you must be Marina. Oh, it's very nice to meet you. What's that? You'd like to help me with this? Oh, that's very kind of you. Would you like to press the button this time? You would, okay. Well, you go ahead and press it then and we'll see what episode I have to watch this week. Who does your hair, by the way? Atlanta? Oh, that's kind of you. Right, what does the printout say? Oh, well, that's a pretty good result. There's certainly worse things I could be doing than watching that. And I can see it's made you very happy. Well, yes, obviously it would do. It may not be a Stingray episode, but it is water-related. It's Joe 90, Trial at Sea. So, uh, I have a bit of a problem here, because every time I see this opening title sequence, I think, wow, this is the greatest opening title sequence in the whole Jerry Anderson universe. And then I see a Stingray episode, and I think, wow, this is the greatest. And on Thunderbirds and UFO, same thing. But, uh, oh, this title sequence is is definitely top five. It is really something special. I really do love this show. As um, I think out of all the Jerry Anderson series, uh, Super Mario Nation and live action, this is easily the most underrated. People assume, oh, because it's got a little kid as the star, it's a kiddie show, and it's it's really not. It's far more sophisticated than, than people would give it credit for. Is anything wrong? Why there's the, the uh, Colonel White Puppet making a, a return appearance now with his hair dyed black and a very snazzy moustache underneath his nose. Time. We sail in 18 hours, man. Get that stuff aboard. I kind of like the idea when you go from from Joe 90 in, in, 
if from Captain Scarlet into Joe Knight in the Secret written. Service that uh, you see the same I'm main up. characters from Captain Scarlet appearing in well, in guest roles. There. It does lend lend more weight to the idea that this is a a regular cast that uh, that keep appearing in these stories. And of course, the Colonel is playing another grumpy, cantankerous right, boss. Up. I want all these crates aboard as soon as possible. Because really, what else would he be playing? What do you think of the hoverliner, Joe? It's great. Is she ready for her maiden voyage? She's ready. First chance I get, Joe, I'll arrange a short trip. Oh, a maiden voyage of a new high-tech vehicle. These never go well. Yes. A bomb with an instant trigger detonator. You a see, it's a, it's a maiden voyage with a bomb. Hoverliner? It's, it's just Jerry Anderson show? tradition. Oh, that siren! That siren noise makes just, oh, so many nostalgic feels. All the sound effects in these make so many nostalgic feels when you start hearing them in, in other shows and, and films. Nothing must go wrong. Nothing will go wrong. Oops, something's gone wrong. So this is episode 27 of Joe 90, and it's, it's one of those episodes where... And I think a lot of the Super Mario Nation shows have these, the ones that run for like 30-odd episodes or so. There are always episodes as you get near the end that get less attention than than earlier episodes. Like, this doesn't get anywhere near as much attention as, say, Hijacked or Project 90 or whatever. But then you watch it in isolation, and it's a perfectly decent little story. Whereas if you're going to watch the whole series back-to-back, -back, it doesn't stand out so much. But uh, there are a lot of stories in Joe 90 that... Uh, I think are pretty, pretty great stories. You were right to tell us, Professor. In fact, I struggle to think of any Joe 90 episodes that really aren't that good. The first episode isn't that good, the last episode isn't that good, but the 28 in the middle are, are pretty much just gold. Why is he smiling? He's, Sam Louver's got his smiling face on because uh, bomb, threats, uh, bomb threats make him happy. I seem to remember that Sam Louver did have a tendency to wear his smiley face at odd times. I remember in Mission X41 he goes to see a sick man, a, a sick man and he can't stop grinning. It's like, oh, this man's dying. Oh, well, sucks to be him. And these dockyard scenes as well, just... Just looking at them, you can see so many details from previous dockyard scenes. You imagine by, by this point in the the history of Century 21, you say do a dockyard scene, they've just got so many leftovers from previous shows that they can just knock it together in half an hour, but it still must have taken a lot of work. I see. Permission unnecessary, Captain, but granted. I really like Shane Weston as a character, and it's interesting that we know that he appeared in Captain Scarlet with, with blonde hair, and something about it just doesn't look right, but as soon as they change the colour of the hair, suddenly the character just, just sort of pops into existence and of course having David Healy providing the voice is uh, another bonus but yeah the puppet never looked right with blonde hair and yet with black it's perfect it's another thing I like about the character as well is that for all his sitting behind the desk making jokes and he does spend most episodes sitting behind the desk it's very rare that he goes out on missions like this but when he does Oh, he can get the job done. He was dismissed from the company for gross malpractice, channeling company money into his own pocket. So he could be holding a grudge. <laughs> Sam smiling again. It's like embezzlement is another thing that makes him happy. We add that to terrorist plots and dying men. Now, people like, for instance, David Graham and... Uh, Ray Barrett, who did lots of voices in the, the earlier Super Mario Nation shows, they quite rightly get a lot of attention and a lot of praise, but then when you get to the near the end of the Century 21 days, when you have people like Keith Alexander, David Healy, they tend not to get as much attention, and I, I really think they should, because, OK, David Healy can't really do many accents as such, he can't disguise his voice, but it's a damn good voice, and he's always giving a really good performance in these. I apologise if I'm not saying much of uh, any real interest or consequence here, but uh, I, I just, any time I see a clip from Joe 90, I just have to sort of give it my full attention. I can't really switch off from this because it is such a good show. It is so underrated, and I wish it could have had the uh, the sort of widespread 
attention that it really deserves than in the same way that the Thunderbirds and Stingray and Captain Scarlet get all the the attention this really deserves it as well which is why I was very surprised when uh, in the early 2000s this wasn't repeated along with the other shows good work Joe he hasn't done anything yet. <laughs> He's just arrived. <laughs> Don't start heaping praise on him. He hasn't done anything yet. I suppose this is kind of a child's wish fulfillment that they can take over any situation and the, they can tell the, the panicking adults what to do. Which is why another reason why I've, I'm really surprised the show never caught on, but uh, like we said, it never had the, the chance to find a, as large an audience as the earlier shows did. I do like this stuff, this uh, Shane Weston's terrible sense of humour, because it shows how far the, these shows had, had developed over the years, because now Shane Weston can make a joke like that and everyone looks at him like he's just a, an idiot. If Shane Weston went to Marineville and did a stand-up act, he would just... He would be the greatest stand-up those people had ever seen. Um, probably same with the, uh, if he went to Tracy Island as well. Well, that was Trial at Sea, and uh, I think this is um, this is an episode that kind of demonstrates the the strengths of the randomizer in that it can pull up an episode like this, which nobody is going to sit down and, and watch. I mean, when was the last time you said to yourself, I am going to sit down and watch Trial at Sea? If you weren't watching like the whole show as a marathon, this is never an episode that you would pull up and look at. But, as I said, like with most of them, there is a lot here to enjoy. There's so much in Joe 90 that that I think really works. And uh, I've always liked this show. I will always like this show and I will always defend it and say that uh, it really deserves a better, a better reputation than it's had over the years. I'm really looking forward to seeing it come out on Blu-ray and uh, hopefully finding a, a new generation of fans. Bye-bye. Nice. Oh, lucky Chris getting some Joe yes. 90. Well, I mean, lucky for him, I'm not so keen on Joe. You're not? Joe, really. Well, you see, now we were I talking love... in our last podcast about uh, Jerry and some memories and our first experience, first episodes that we remember. And I said Space 1999 breakaway, but I do actually remember the opening sequence that the, the big rat spinning and Joe sitting hmm. inside is very definitely a memory uh, from my childhood. Probably first time, no, not first time round, surely. No, not uh, 50 years ago. 68? No. No, no, not quite. No, no but a repeat. Yes. Uh, yeah, Richard, you're far too young for that. Yes, quite, Come exactly. On. That's right. Um, no, I just... Joe, I, I really like the premise, and I love the big rat and all that sort of stuff, yeah. but I, I just found Joe just really precocious and annoying. Um, and, it, yeah, I, but, it, just took, it just took the edge off for me. Yeah, there is a problem with young sort of prodigies in sci-fi series, isn't there? You know, Adric in Doctor Who and uh, Wesley Crusher in uh, in Star Trek. Well, and young um, Anakin in that uh, yes. you know, Star Wars prequel thing. Yes. I mean, it's so irritating. Yeah. Really. It's so easy to be a complete turn-off. And for me, Joe was a real oh. turn-off from that show, which is yeah. a great shame. Yeah. He had lots of potential. Anyway. Yeah, but how uh, appropriate on his 50th anniversary. Exactly, or 59th birthday, yeah, people say. Like that's right, that's right. Uh, anyway, there we go. Hmm. Um, so, that's everything, isn't it? We're done. I think we've just about got through it all, haven't we? Yeah. So if you'd like to pick up some Jerry Anderson goodies, including the MEV that we've talked about uh, earlier on in the news section, then please pop along to the Jerry Anderson store, shop.jerryanderson.co.uk. Uh, you know, tell your friends about the podcast. If you hate it, say Keep nothing. Quiet. If you love it. <laughs> Tell us, tell everybody, <laughs> tell the world. It'd be great to, to hear from you anyway. Podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. And um, is that it, Richard? Are we done? I think that's about it. So we'll see you next time for more interviews, uh, for more news, and hopefully some more listeners' emails. Uh, in the meantime, take good care, and we'll see you next time. Ta-ra. Bye-bye. Stage one complete. Let's go. Spectrum is green.